live. I guess we're live. All right, there we go. <laughs> Hello, everybody. My name is Adam Antor, director of the comp, uh, director of esports at Florida Southern, but also the comp council chair. Um, this is the high school esports forum, I believe, and none of us know what we're going to be talking about. So, uh, start thinking of questions. It should be fun. Uh, I'm going to let everyone on this panel here introduce themselves and give whatever spiel they'd like to give, I guess. Well, good morning. Uh, my name is Kristen Kraft, and I am actually representing Generation Esports and Gaming Concepts. I've been in education for about 27 years, actually, in the state of Kansas, and um, just recently came on with Generation Esports because I believe in just getting it into the hands of as many kids as possible. Um, and so that's why I have decided to make a career change this late in life. But um, my wheelhouse is definitely education, curriculum, instruction, um, and how to get it into the hands of every single kid. I introduced myself a little bit, but the, all, the background of why I'm on the panel is before I coached collegiate, I started a high school team at West Catholic High School in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and built the first esports lab in a high school in the state. Uh, so I guess, I don't know. It's been fun. Oh, you got your arm. Nice. Greetings, everyone. It's a pleasure to see you all. Gerald Solomon from NASAF. Um, I always find it odd that I sit here in esports uh, world because really what NACEF is is a nonprofit that's an education program. We just use esports because that's where kids hang out. That's how kids speak and enjoy. And we use that as an opportunity for workforce development and um, curriculum learning. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about what we do and how we do, but it's a pleasure to be here with a, such an austere group. And I'm Rob Johnson. I'm the CEO of Playfly Esports. Uh, we help operate in the state of Washington, uh, now Arizona and Louisiana. Uh, our goal here, and very much like our partnership with NACE and being able to support the 501c3 in education, um, we're trying to bring that to high school, which is a wildly different business and nuanced business and something that uh, everybody here, I hope, has an opinion for. We can talk about certainly getting into questions, uh, but our goal is to uh, grow the success of the amount of students that have the opportunities to participate in esports, get them to higher education, get them into NACE Star League, and be able to help fund this in a way where we have less volunteers, we have more teachers that are able to help fund their programs across the country. Who has a question? <laughs> or, or a topic that you would like us to start off with, because it's too early for me to think of one. Yes. Here, let me bring your. So the online folks can hear you. Yeah. So um, one of um, I'm from Wayne's. My name is Matt Piak from Waynesburg University. Um, we're just south of, of Pittsburgh. Um, we've had some grant money go through for for high schools in our area, um, getting Nintendo Switches into their um, into their classrooms. But one of the struggles has been. Essentially, teachers are fairly overtaxed as a whole, and then to some of them see this opportunity as something that's that's more of a more of a hassle. I guess you you said you know we're not gonna we don't need more volunteers, but it's about equipping the teachers and allowing the teachers. I guess just from somebody that's outside of the high school space, what does that look like? Getting teachers to buy in and to kind of grow these programs because, yeah, that can be difficult. Well, I can speak to that from principal perspective and kind of what we're doing now, you know, with Generation Esports. But, you know, I think teachers are taxed and I think it is an exhausting time right now in education. And I think something that, uh, that, I, that I think is really powerful um, that makes it easy for teachers is, you know, gaming concepts, um, has d several different kinds of courses. And so I think when you start putting it within to your educational day and creating that scholastic pipeline, ours are aligned to CTE pathways. And so when you do that, then you have more students getting involved. And because we have the courses, every, and we also have a, a partnership with a learning management system. So everything is housed in one place. So really what we're trying to do I'm not a gamer. I am a self-proclaimed non-gamer. I was great at Miss Pac-Man back in the day. Um, but it's going to be, in order to create that scholastic pipeline, it's going to have to be teachers implementing those types of things that maybe don't have any idea 
And the word esports sounds scary to them. Esports requires a lot of education, whether it be principals, teachers, superintendents, even board members and parents, right? And so we try to make it and develop it in a way that is, is with ease. So that is one way that I think, um, you know, I was in a school where we had um, clubs after school and our teachers weren't even paid. So part of that is we got to get that narrative changed for your clubs. But I also believe that when all you're offering is clubs, which are great, um, then we're not, we're not really getting all kids, which is why if you can start implementing it from a scholastic way. So in, in answering your question a little bit further, as far as like, uh, you're at the college level, is that correct? Okay. So in working with colleges um, like yourself, we um, have a course that's a level two course. Um, it's called Interactive Media. Um, um, and esports, and it's about 186 lessons, and um, it's so robust it could probably be taught over the course of two years. But because it's in the technical level of the CTE pathway, what I'm what I'm starting to do is like kind of work with um, colleges um, to work and have dual or concurrent current, current, concurrent credit with schools. Um, and so it's because it's so easy. Somebody like me. I could teach it, no problem. It has to be a business teacher, you know, for that particular course. But we want it to be simplistic. And so the teachers that we've been working with love it and they have so much joy around it now. So if anything, we're bringing a lot of joy to teachers, right? Um, but I think that having that just ease of it all is really, because teachers are like, I can't do one more thing. I can't plan at night, I can't do. So when you have something that can just be handed to them on a silver platter, plus, if you're working with a college and they're doing the dual or concurrent credit, the schools can get money for that too. So in the state of Kansas, they, they get money. So um, that was kind of long-winded, I know, but it just as a kind of way to, I, I get what you're saying around it. And I think you have to, you have to kind of start putting it into the, the courses and the classes and, and then develop your club, which then develops for your teams. So just some ideas. Yeah, let me add to that if I can as well. Our approach is a little bit different in that we're really about how to inculcate culturally the concept of play and learning together. And we do it through a systems approach. Um, in Pennsylvania, for example, you know, given my background, having been in philanthropy for 20 years, um, we had a relationship with the Department of Ed in Pennsylvania and Governor Wolf and Judd Pittman and Demetrius Roberts and the like. And what we ended up doing was going to the educational system, which is what we do and how we operate. And we went to the Chester County IU and we set up this whole concept about esports and gaming and play and learning through the IU. We now have not a lot, about 145 schools in Pennsylvania, all through the IU system. Um, so that there's support there, so it doesn't overtax or overburden educators. And then the other thing is we were, again, part of our relationship in STEM education. We helped craft and develop the PA Smart Grant. And I think maybe that's part of what you're referring to. Um, and through that, we were able to add language within that around both PD as well as the opportunity to buy and fund peripherals through the CS labs and other activities that are there. And then through the IUs and the PD that they provide and do, you know, there's a whole set of curriculum and opportunities around support for teachers, because that's really what they need. Um, so ESSER funding, Perkins funding, those types of things. So between all of us here, we all have different ways of doing things, but we all can provide solutions and support to you in the way you want to pursue what it is you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let me echo that everybody here has a different philosophy and certainly way to, you know, make sure that kids and as they particularly in high school are participating less in traditional stick and ball sports than they ever were their, you know, how can we get that student athlete structure to them, with them, where they're going to be? And you said Nintendo Switch, nothing against Nintendo. But if we're talking with the school, the last thing I want them to do is to spend money on Nintendo. I want them to get a high-powered 3080 that can then help with the career development items around broadcast production and what's going on here, not just in esports, but in gaming in general. Uh, and if they even have a land center or local land center hospitality within the lens of esports, uh, beyond the networking and IT and STEM education and do it. So helping these schools do it. But one thing is state by state, every state, we work with state associations. That's the only reason that we would e even be able to help here um, is that in order to be able to build esports programs, they're expensive. They're expensive at college and pro and high school, wherever you're going to be. This equipment that we're doing is very expensive. Uh, and to be able to help bring the cost down and get more access to it, there's different ways to attack it. So one, 
uh, you know, where Playfly, our parent company, has multimedia rights and state organizations, we have a set group that is already there, that is already embedded with the state association, the nonprofit, in order to figure out what is best for the state to build on esports to what's already working maybe with volleyball or football state championships or basketball state championships. Uh, and now we come back to an access problem. So we have this expensive, expensive equipment. Uh, we have kids that aren't participating in stick and ball sports. So we're solving the problem here of how to make sure that the teachers, the schools, they're getting the resources, they're getting the know-how. And whether that comes from NACE or whether that comes from other partners in education, we're not in education. We find educational partners that the state helps be able to bring in so we can talk to administrators to know that this is not just more screen time. This is structured in a way that if you're not gonna participate in a stick and ball sport, which I will argue as a student athlete, high school and college and beyond that, uh, you know, is very valuable for people to grow up in. Um, and that education to the administrators being able to help fund it. Uh, that's certainly the philosophy that we go, um, but it's state by state for sure. And there is no, I, I feel there's no national one size fits all. Uh, a cost model per student is taxing and makes more of the haves and have nots within esports. And listen, I went to Atlantic City High School and the graduation rate was really low. And because I was a rower is the only reason I got to college. Many people didn't. And if you couldn't shoot a, a free throw or you know throw a football 40 yards, you didn't have a lot of a chance. What we can do and what the people up here can do is be able to help fix that possibly. Uh, but finding the right structures and making sure that the educators are empowered with the knowledge of it having people, and I know there's a, a lot of vocal people within this space, there should be, there's a lot of high school students that are impressionable yes. that we all wanna get to higher education. Maybe if that's not right for them, at least career development opportunities, esports can do that. Yep. Uh, but finding different ways to do it, that's what we're doing here. Yep. Lauren. Oh, One second. I actually have a question for you about this. Okay. Yes, so the people online can hear you. Thank you. Um, I have a question for you around your curriculum. And so can you speak to where your curriculum pieces get, get input, uh, implemented into um, a student's day? So some of what I heard you talk about was after school stuff. Yeah. But it sounds like some of the things you're at, you know, you have would go into actual, you know, the normal day that a student would be. And Curriculum is usually set at a state level, mm -hmm. or and and then the um, you know the school system. So, what kind of things are you are you looking at to be building in that way? <clears throat> sure, yeah. So, and I, I like to use kind of the term courses. I mean, we do have curriculum that we've written, but I think um, just to start with a misconception around curriculum is a lot of schools and high schools in particular. Um, end up thinking that they can't um, implement something right away because they don't have an approved class. The reality is, is we've aligned our courses to all kinds of different standards, whether it's ISTE, social emotional, um, computer science teachers. Um, so when you have that, it's no different than bringing in lessons that maybe teachers get off teachers pay teachers, things like that. So you can actually look at what standards it is you have to teach, and then you can look at any of our courses and figure out where those standards then, then go for um, the teacher to use. So you can start implementing right away. Um, as far as how it looks in the school day, you know, there has been some research done. So one of our authors, Dr. Russell, um, implemented one of the first classes, and he actually put it in first hour of the day for high school. Um, and this was an alternative high school and it ended up improving attendance from 86% to 96%. Um, these students ended up kind of finding their peer group because they put it in first hour. So to me, it's no different than a band class. Band is first hour. Um, people make the argument, you know, that, you know, nobody's going to go into esports and have a job, right? As you guys all laugh about that. But um, it's no different than a band player who is not going to play trombone for, you know, uh, their future and be a professional trombone player, but they're learning all the skill sets, which is exactly what esports, the courses are doing. So our courses um, throughout the day, did you want like a specific example of a course? Like what? It, okay, so we have a level one course that um, is can be taught. It's like an intro for, for freshmen. Um, it can be a year long, it can be a half a year, depending on how they want to put it into their schedule and anybody can teach it. So it's an elective credit. 
Um, then we would have a level two course that can be taught. Um, it has to be taught by either a CTE pathway certified teacher so that they can get their funding or they have to have um, a business certified teacher or whatever, you know, whichever area it is that they um, um, need to use. That's the one that we can work with colleges on as well for some dual and concurrent credit. Um, because it fits into the CTE pathway, then we'll have a third course um, about a year from now, which will be um, the application level of the CTE pathway. So very project-based capstone project. Um, and then what's really cool is we love to partner with teachers um, and, and compensate for their intellectual property. Um, for the, you're using the hook of eSports to teach a lesson, so you can use all multiple games every week. Um, but we're going to have a middle school course that drops this fall. And um, coming in January, we're going to have a cybersecurity course. We're going to have a shoutcasting course for broadcast credit. And we're going to have a course uh, for speech credit um, that is around streaming. So kids who hate to take speech, I know being a high school principal, that was one of the classes that kids had to pass to graduate and often did not. Um, and so if we can hook those kids, what we're finding is we're hooking, we're getting about 10 to 15% of the population who've never been involved in, in anything who are hooking into the esports and, and using. So that's where we want to create that pipeline, normalize esports in schools, create CTE pathway for it that just builds your robust programs. It also provides, um, like they were saying a little bit around, you know, equity. Um, I was in an affluent school, I'll be honest, um, before, and we had a club and it was um, at home. We didn't have anything at school and I knew it was a have and a have not situation. So when you start putting it in scholastically, now you're getting more and more kids involved in it. They're finding their peer group, their grade points are going up, their attendance is going up and they're coming to you. Does that help? Does that answer your question? Okay, thanks. And I think uh, some of the comments that I've heard from the conference so far is, is, frankly, is that some of the people in this room don't necessarily see, understand why they should care about high school. And I think you started to allude to the answer to that. But beyond kids getting to them, what should be, why should the people who are at the collegiate ranks care about this beyond just them getting to them? How can they support uh, their local high schools or, or the, the community, because as we've seen, and I know it's a, a long question, but sorry, I do a podcast, so I have to ask the long question. Yeah. <clears throat> Let's take, uh, for example, right now, we had the issue with Riot and League of Legends, mm -hmm. and that now has been reversed, but now we're seeing the same issue with Blizzard and them saying, sorry, we're not going to let you play Overwatch. So how can high school, college uh, coaches support high school beyond just saying, hey, let's get you ready to come be with our kids. James O'Hagan, always love your questions. <laughs> um, you know, because we come from it from a different perspective as an EDU, as a nonprofit education organization, we look at things a little bit differently. One of the conversations I've had with a number of folks here and elsewhere is the idea that it's not about esports and gaming, it's about student development. It's about giving kids opportunities to see a future for themselves. It's about the idea of providing near peer mentorship and developing students at the collegiate level as well as the high school level. One of the things that uh, we've utilized successfully with colleges besides your basic dual enrollment opportunities and the like is the idea of what we call our esports ambassadors program which is a way of developing college students to be ombudsmen for the college and university. I mean, we know that in almost every case, esports doesn't generate money for the college and university. It is a brand opportunity. It is a recruitment opportunity. How do you expand upon that? How do you actually become a partner with the admissions department, with the um, alumni association and with others within the college itself so that you add value, not always monetary value, but value to the college. High school kids often don't know where they wanna go, what they wanna do and what those pathways are. When you can actually set up a construct within a college or a university where they can be an arm of the brand and the identity of what the college is, and they can go into and serve as a near peer mentor in helping high schools support and create the re-sports programs, but more than that, inquire and be a mentor to these kids and say, you know, have you thought about college? 
I know you're into esports. Do you know a little bit about our program? You can come and play, but you know, we have a great school of engineering. We have a great school in political science. We have all these other opportunities. It really creates not only that recruitment opportunity for the college where esports can be a focal point and add value to the university infrastructure, but it really provides these kids an opportunity to build an articulated pathway for their future. And that's really the tack that we take and think about it well beyond the concept of engagement around a particular title or play, but how do we help these students? Because our future are our kids and our future starts in middle school. We all know that come you know, seventh grade, most of these kids have their minds made up of what they don't like. They don't necessarily know what they like, but how can colleges and esport players in colleges really be those near peer mentors to help these kids assess and evaluate what their future is? And James, for your question, I'm gonna back out a little bit on, on just the right sense. Listen, if everybody isn't aware uh, League of Legends was uh, an exclusive title to one tournament operator for quite some time. Riot had reversed that and opened up the ecosystem. Uh, what I personally think should should be done. Kids should be able to play the games that they want to play, that gets them engaged, that gets them into these ecosystems that we're talking about, including these Starlink. Now, let's Blizzard, and I think Blizzard and Overwatch was a specific question here, so I'm going to address that. Uh, Blizzard and Overwatch are exclusive to one operator. This is a game some people want to play, though. You can say Overwatch 2 and the mistakes, so that's a different uh, panel here. Uh, from that perspective, the opportunity for the colleges and for NACE particularly is, listen, you can't play these in high school. People are going to play it. Operators are going to operate. and They're going to do with things whether they're licensed or not. But for NACE schools particularly, now for your regional high schools that you know can't play that, host an Overwatch tournament call it a youth tournament, whatever it needs to be in order to, if these kids are engaged in this particular game, NACE schools now have an opportunity to host them on campus. And listen, this is what Blizzard, the rules that they want. And if you want to back way out, and Curtis is going to roll his eyes and make, because I say this all the time, this industry, we're playing with a ball somebody else owns. This is IP that we don't own, a ball that, listen, they can control, they can do whatever they want. You know, a billion dollars a year game in Call, Call of Duty, uh, you know, that's, that's a lot. And for us to be stewards of that brand, everybody in this room here, to be able to operate that IP, we do need to follow rules. We do need to build trust. We need to certainly build trust of how to teach our students what IP rules are, possibly. I think that might even be for, you know, I'm a legal student in the future. But specifically to that question, when we do have games that have restrictions, and I think we're only down to one at this point, but for the NACE schools, bring the opportunity to your campus. Turn something that, listen, I personally don't feel that there should be exclusives for operator within esports, period, end of discussion, any level. But it becomes an opportunity when you can flip that to get kids that might want to play this game onto your campus for recruitment or to show them that this broader ecosystem in esports and career development does exist. Uh, so that's specifically answer your question on, on Blizzard. I have much more thoughts on that, but not for you. Can I just echo something there too? You, t you mentioned, you know, about how can the schools, you know, work with the high schools. And I just, I kind of want to show a hands really quick. How many of you go through your athletics departments with your esports programs? And how many of you are your activities like student involvement? Okay. So there's kind of a mix. And I would say that even, um, with at the high school level, um, I think that the best way to get relationships between the colleges and the schools is not necessarily, um, always going to be athletics. I think in order to create um, relationships between us and the colleges, we have to go academic and that's kind of our take on it. And so we, we really want, um, you all to have the relationships with kids. And it just makes a lot of sense when you start talking about esports in a way that is purposeful play. Like we talked about, you know, I think you mentioned earlier, esports is not just screen time. There's a huge difference in screen time and purposeful play. So when you can really get it into the academic arena, then you all at, at the college level, we can help to bridge those relationships at a much in a much easier and robust way. And right now, as far as funding and things like that, schools have more funding than they've ever had um, to be able to implement these things. And you can actually implement a lot of esports um, as well as our courses, equipment, things like that through ESSER funding. So those are the things that um, I really like to talk to people about because there's a lot of education around it. 
you know, being in the high school world for as long as I was and talking to high school principals and superintendents and things like that, they really don't have a good understanding of what esports is actually teaching our kids. So if we go that route, you're going to have much more um, kids involved going to your schools. Um, you're going to have better relationships, better recruiting. Um, I just think that's a great avenue to go through. So, yeah. Yeah. I have uh, one suggestion to you uh, from personal experience, and then I have a question. Uh, I was an educator for 20 years in Kansas and Oklahoma, and uh, I grew up with uh, hearing aid braces and glasses. Mm -hmm. And so my father was superintendent, and in the late 70s, I had inclusion, no child left behind. Yeah. And I excelled in sports, but I did not excel in, in the classroom. Mm -hmm. And so as I got older, because of my hearing impairment and visual, I excelled in hand-eye coordination. Mm -hmm. And so with that, um, I started playing games in Atari, Missile Command, you know, Yay. like that. Yay for Atari, Pitfall. But, oh, well, yeah, I, yeah, Pitfall. Doo -doo 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 -doo. Anyway, yeah. um, but the question, and then I became an educator in PE and went to college and the question is, yeah, there's a multi-billion dollar market in it. I have a business that I invested my dollars into esports when it kicked off, and I promoted esports stuff. The question is, why are these kids playing the games? Mm -hmm. That's the question. Most kids who play the games is because they do not want to be yelled at by coaches. They don't want to be made fun of by peers. The teachers were riding my, my ass because I wasn't producing what my father was looking at them. And it was very difficult for me. I didn't want to wear hearing aids. And so I, after I played sports, I went home because I didn't have to worry about teachers yelling at me. I didn't have to worry about coaches. And that's the main reason why kids play games. Mm -hmm. Kids, not adults, the young adults. I'm saying that's the reason why kids play games. Mm -hmm. because they don't want to be yelled at. And I was in my own world. I didn't have to hear the game. Of course, they didn't have speeches in Atari and you know Nintendo and stuff. And that's the question you asked the high school students. And when I would teach at the middle school, yeah. I you know it was tough. tough. But then I was playing these games and I was connecting to them. And then last year I was teaching middle school, and I said, yeah, I compete in the Z League. I do Fortnite, I play COD, and they're looking at me like, really, you're an old man playing these games? You know, I'm like, yeah, but I was able to connect to them. And I think a lot of us enjoy playing games because we don't have to worry about the social life, it's what's expected of us. And so that's what my question would be, when you really recruit a high school student, why are you playing the game? Mm -hmm. Are you really wanting to be a professional? You know, why do we play football? Well, they're making millions of dollars. Well, yeah, we, we all probably know a football player that went to the NFL, but it's 1%, you know? So I would say as a recruiter, and which is my question for recruiting, when I go to a high school, as an educator, we see all the propaganda from all, you know, all the colleges and stuff, come to this, come to this. So my question is, is NAIS and the partners willing to submit or have some kind of, it'll be, bite your budget, obviously, but, are you guys or NASA partner would be willing to provide some propaganda on our behalf as a recruiting school, all for all of us who want to recruit? At, you know, if it hadn't, if it's not for the kids in the school, we wouldn't be here, none of us. So, if it's a propaganda, I hate to say propaganda. I mean, I don't know what else to call it. But if there's some material that you guys would be willing to provide for us when we recruit. Is that a possibility? I mean, is that in the future? Is what that... would that look like to you? Just to um, clarify, what would propaganda 
Well, you Black, know, I know uh, okay, what would that hey, look like? What, to, would the, what would you want provided? Well, I say, okay, hey, League Spot's got all this for you, and then PlayFly's got all this that you can access. And you come to the school, we're going to provide not only the pictures and, you know, of, of our, every one of us to have a place, the reason why you want to come to school, but will you guys be willing to provide extra information to give us that incentive? Not, you know, it's not an incentive to join the school, but it's an incentive to be in esports. Mm -hmm. You know, so if you guys may sometime or if you already have plans that, hey, um, we're going to send it to your college and your college are going to print out a little pamphlet of the benefits of being in esports as far as NACE is concerned, as far as Playfly. And, you know, are you guys willing to help us recruit the kids? You know, instead of the mentality of, you know, most college professors say, bring, if you bring them in, I would teach them. And that doesn't work. You know? So we, we're going to need a little help. It's always nice to have help. So are you guys willing to provide um, incentives, not only for them to join the school, but also to look into the esports, you know, mm -hmm. realm, I should yeah. say. Which I think that, yeah, I think, and I think that's easy to do when you are talking academics, because I think that's how we can get things to you. So we want to be able to create something that's simplistic between the schools and the high schools. Um, we hope to, you know, eventually partner with somebody on that so that it's easy to, to have that connection, because I think that is important. Um, and that's, it, again, it's seeing it from, you have to look at it from a learn, play, or compete side of things. Like, why do you play? So some kids are just going to learn skills through it and they can go into the, the industry. Other kids are going to want to play in a club student activity so that they have a peer group. And then others are going to want to compete at a higher level. So I think you do have to do that. And of course, I mean, as a high school person is what I'm thinking. And as somebody who represents that kind of side of things, yes, we would want to do what we could to help, um, you know, be mutually beneficial. So there's probably just a need in general to educate our coaches and directors on the positives of esports in general. Uh, educate ourselves, but also educate students and parents beyond competition. Um, I think I'd even struggle with coming up with some of these positives because I'm just not in that world. Like the academic side, I know so little about some of the words that Gerald was spewing I've never heard of before. Um, but that's just because I'm not aware of it. Like I, I come from the competition side. Um, so that's, that's what I know. Um, but there's so much more value in that. And then selling esports to parents is it has not gotten maybe it's gotten a little easier to some parents, but for the vast majority, it, it's not gotten easier. And, and it's a tough sell to some parents. Um, so maybe NACE coming up with some of those materials and providing. Right. Right. I'm assuming mm -hmm. most of these entities up here already mm -hmm. have those materials available on yes. their website. I know NACEF has a ton of resources like that. Um, obviously they're more catered to the high school level, um, but maybe there's, there's an opportunity there to create we resources have a, yeah. for members. We have a ton of resources that can be used. Yeah. <laughs> um, I wanted to touch base a little bit too on answering the your, kind of your question about involving or reaching out to the high schools. Uh, so at UM Flint, we are dead center uh, of Flint, Michigan, mm -hmm. you know, not one of the best of areas, but we have three college campuses within a half mile. Um, as far as outreach and how I approach it with local schools or boys and girls clubs, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> other entities that are working with the youth of Flint, um, I kind of use it as a, as a carrot to dangle out in front of these students. Um, it's something to bring them in off the street. And if I can get them to campus to, to see what's a, a potential or a possibility, um, that is usually a, a rather large incentive. Um, and working with these entities, I also make it very clear when I'm talking to the parents or the directors of these other programs or high schools, mm -hmm. that it's more about the development of the student or as a person not as a gamer, not as a potential student on campus. And I think as much as my recruitment and development people would hate to hear me say this, we also have to be, as an institution, be prepared 
to pass that student on or give them a direction that may not include my campus. Mm -hmm. um, you have to be able to say, well, you know what, maybe a community college yeah. may be your next step and then help them in that process. Uh, or even maybe a trade school yeah. or maybe your route. Um, but it, it all circles back to the esports or the gaming perspective is that that's, that's the commonality. That's what all these kids are doing. And if it, us as adults or coaches or directors are able to reach the youth and their parents and you know, make that connection and say, well, look, this is an opportunity for your student um, or your child. Uh, within Flint and in Michigan, we have some uh, scholarship opportunities. It's called like the Flint Promise or the Michigan Promise, where a lot of parents in inner city Flint aren't aware that their children could actually attain a four-year degree at no cost. And, but it's, it's establishing that, that point of connection. Um, and another side too, we work with, um, we have early colleges in Michigan. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. where it's, yep. You can kind of do like a dual enrollment. Uh, working with those institutions, um, we have one on campus and I've opened up our space as well, at, not just to them, but to any um, school district within the ISD. I've opened up our space yes. at no cost to those high schools to give them the opportunity especially if their superintendents or their principals or their, the boards will say, well, we don't want to invest this money right now. Um, if, you can, if you can and if you're willing to open up your space to those outside schools, mm -hmm. give them a taste of what's the potential or what the possibility is, it's like a, a free ticket for them to experience it. They may get one or two students to try it out. Worst case scenario, you're getting one or two students on your campus, they get to like you, they're familiar, possible enrollment. Um, but what I found in our early college program, they had uh, nine students the very first semester, I let them use our space. Uh, the second semester, they used, uh, they had 18 students. And then the, the instructor that was running the program asked if he could do like a, a first hour, an early morning class which then filled up our entire lab space with students to teach them the mm -hmm. communication skills, the mm -hmm. teamwork, um, you know, the organization. They had students that were going everywhere from, they wanted to broadcast and do that aspect of it because some of the girls weren't gamers, but they were awesome in social media, which pretty right. much every teenage girl right now and boy um, seems to have a very unique skill set. So it was, Partnering with those other entities, I think, is a, a big way for colleges and universities, yeah. and community colleges, trade schools that have esports programs to to buffer and to build that that connectivity. So. You're, you're speaking my language. That's exactly what I like to talk to people about that are at your level and how they can partner with their local high schools because it is it's that's creating that entire ecosystem for those kids. So that's awesome. Good job. Yeah, so I think we uh, show a hands of every college program in the room. Um, how many would you say is your primary focus for your program competition? You recruit based on competition, you're on campus to compete. How many of you would say that? Okay, good number. So do we fear, and this is a, a thing that I've heard before, um, specifically when we talk about high school, that esports is a vehicle, that we want to use esports e for the, the curriculum, the, um, you know, the actual emotional learning and stuff like that. Do we fear there is a disconnect and a disservice for high school students that are learning that at the high school level, and then they get to the college level where it's more focused on the competition, not so much on maybe necessarily the career path that's obviously a part of it, do we fear there's a disservice to the students to where they're not being prepared? I've had this several times within my, my students that come in of, I do exit interviews with them. Like, hey, how do you feel after your four years, two years, whatever it is, um, how do you feel it was? Was this what you expected? And the overwhelming answer I get is no. This is not what I expected. Um, I hear them come in and say, yeah, we, just, we thought we were gonna show up and play games and go home. And I'm like, no, like I'm here to develop you as a player, as an adult to get you prepared for what's gonna be coming up in the real world. Um, and I've had kids that have dropped out because of it. Cause they're like, this is just too much. I, I wasn't ready for this. My high school did not prepare me for this. Right. Do we feel there's a disservice for high school students that they're not getting adequately prepared for what's gonna happen when they get to a college esports program? 
Yes. <laughs> There's a definite disconnect. I don't, do you guys want to say something? Uh, yes. So this is why we work state by state with state athletic associations, the disconnect between high school and college and the student athletics. Over the past hundred years, we've done fairly good job of making sure that translates into college though. At college, it becomes a little bit more focused and a little bit harder, normally across the board for whatever sport we're talking about. Because esports is so new and because we don't have enough students and enough resources to do this in a way that we've been able to do traditional sports. And I'm talking about the game itself. I'm just talking about how students can grow within from 14 to 18, learning how teamwork, it, now mental health, physical fitness, being able to work with other people. Those are the skills we're talking about between 14 and 18 that we're trying to get them to bring. The mechanism here is esports. Esports is just underdeveloped. And I could say that what we're trying to do and work with the states that we work with is what has worked well, in air quotes, because there's some things broken here as far as scholarships and how we give those out. What has worked well to get kids prepared for college in traditional sports? How can that translate in a state association to esports so we don't have this issue of an emerging media and emerging sport where we're not preparing these kids for college? And the state associations we work with, that's part of the discussion too. And to make sure that we're able to, one, we're not reinventing the wheel. We know that we can help get from a state association level and what PlayFly can help support, we can get kids to higher education. If higher education is not where they want to go, if they want to go to a trade school, that's fine. That's different. Uh, but they have that skill set of teamwork and being able to work with people. And I would say as a student athlete, formerly, the skills that helped me grow up and get a career and know how to like talk to people. Uh, that's what we're trying to translate here. So we do have a problem of underdeveloped. That's why we work specifically with state associations. And the mechanism to do that is using the knowledge of that base, not trying to recreate it to do that at a faster rate than we could on our own or as just a single for-profit entity that's entering a space. This is why we partner with the 501c3s, the state associations from a college level and our partnership with NACE, different, but very similar, making sure that education is led first and then we're preparing these programs for these kids to learn a lot more than just how to play the game. So I think Rob, you, your words around how nascent the field is in esports really resonates, and it's an evolution like any other kind of industry or field or opportunity that gets developed. Um, it's still a child, and it's crawling and it's learning how to walk. And throughout that maturing process, systems need to be put into place, um, better articulation of purpose behind it. One of the things that I think Jenny and Nasef have done well is around some of the research work we've uh, individually done. That's a great opportunity to begin to not only articulate the value proposition, but also to be able to couch it in a way that's meaningful to the parent and to the student and to the opportunities that, that exist there. So it's really a, a deep cultural conversation around how do you reframe um, what the opportunity is in a way based upon evidence, based upon efficacy, based upon good quality research that says, hey, this is what we can do. This is the, the proof that shows that there's value in this and then create the kind of partnerships with the administration of the schools that make sense. So many, how many provosts when they're sitting down and looking at the budget understand the value proposition of what esports is for your school. I would venture to say a very, very, very minute number. Understand and as a result, put it into their budget in a way that recognizes the value proposition for the education of the child, as well as for the benefit of the school. So there's a whole lot that needs to be done in tapping into the research that Jenny has done, the research that NASEF has done, the work that Playfly has done. You really have amongst the three of us a lot of data and information. We approach it a little bit differently, but it's really all for the same purpose of how do we advance the opportunity for both higher education, high school, and students and families in particular for kids to be able to thrive and grow. It's gonna take some time and we're gonna all stumble across this process as we go through it. But as we try to work together, even though we may have differences in how we approach things and do things, that's how, mature, that, that's how a field matures. And that's part of what I think we're all trying to figure out and develop as we all move forward. Can I ask a clarifying question on that really quick? 
Are you saying they aren't adequately prepared for competition or adequately prepared mentally? Watch very very talented, um, but he played in the high schools where it was a club atmosphere. That yeah, they did a little bit with curriculum, but not a whole lot. And then he got trans- transferred into a varsity program where we had very strict schedules. We were very to the T on these are your expectations, and he failed because he did not have that structure in high school. Yes, so that's where my question is: to if we feel to this service that we're hitting the curriculum so part of it, and maybe not so much on the structure and the competition aspect as well. So it's not that whole well rounded when they actually get to the call. I think I think you need both. I think you need that structure in both. And I think when you start helping high schools, because that's what we're talking about is high schools, high school esports. And I think when you start creating that structure, um, both in your club as well as within your classes, then I think you're gonna see better return on investment of those kids that come into your program. So for example. Um, Some of the things that uh, we do in our courses is um, we actually have mental health moments, which are self-reflective. That's some of the evidence base that he was talking about as far as um, how we're actually helping students with mental health and social emotional skills and all of those skills that they need to be successful, whether they are a member of a team, whether they're individual. I think those types of things, both, you know, in a scholastic program, as well as in a competitive program, they're not, it, you can use our courses for even your competitive program, but it gives it a system. It gives it, you know, an identity. It gives them, um, structure as a coach. I think sometimes, you know, the coaches, um, that, that I've seen, uh, with, with their, uh, clubs, it's just, it is kind of just a fun, like ours were off campus and we didn't really have any structure to it. And we didn't have any type of learning that goes in with it as well. So, um, I, th- I think that when you put both of those things in place, you're going to have better prepared kids for who are coming to you at, the, at that level. Does that help answer your question a little bit? Okay. Yeah, I, I agree to an, I, I agree the, the, the high school side needs all of this, but I also agree on the opposite side that we as coaches are not prepared to mm-hmm. accept and coach students. Mm-hmm. I've talked about talent development and that in my opinion, almost no one in collegiate is developing talent. And I stand by that. And it's because most of us don't know what it means to be a coach. Like we don't know how to coach students. We don't know how to teach students. Like some of us, yes, have faculty backgrounds. Some of us maybe coached soccer at a high school before, but most of us, the vast majority have never coached or led students before. And we're trying to figure out what that means. And when a student comes to us who has never had structure and we're trying to create structure, we don't know how to navigate that with a student Mm -hmm. until we do it a lot. So, uh, I think, yes, the onus can be put a little bit on the high school side. It would be great if every kid comes from a competitive team of four years and knows what it means to be on a team. That's just not the reality. I mean, I, I get like we one, go there, yeah. one recruit a year, maybe mm-hmm. that's been on a team before, like 90% of my recruits have never played on a team. Mm-hmm. They've played it in their room mm-hmm. for however many years. And there's so many soft skills and discipline that's just yeah. not developed and we are expected to bring them up to a college level of being a competitor. If you know what college athletics is like anyone who's been a college athlete, like I haven't, but I've seen some stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, We, we are so far from what it means to be a college athlete at at what the traditional sports do and operate at like their schedules, their regiments, like none of us are at that point yet. I mean, at some point we will be, but there's so much learning that we have to do as coaches as well. Well, it's just like you said, it's a baby and 90% of kids are involved in esports have never been involved in anything else in school. So it's a baby that we've got to help raise. First off, I know that we're close to end of time. Chase Newcomb with St. Ambrose. So I'm, I'm very thankful that uh, we've had this discussion today because I think that um, there's been a couple of things that's brought up and, and I hope that my, my question is actually really circum, uh, it really brought everything in from what we've talked about. But um, we brought up the word community earlier, right? And we just talked about how some high schools are able to develop programs, but a vast majority of high schools are not able to start programs because they're being gatekept or they are being stopped uh, by the uh higher levels, right? The principal, vice principal. So with that being said in community, right? Um, 
I'm going to use the Quad Cities, for example. We have mm -hmm. Joe Loomis, uh, who's at Augustana, who was previously with Carroll University. And then we have Ali Vandermeide at uh, Davenport University or Davenport High School. Um, and she's president of the ISEA. So we have formed and, and trying to start an esports coalition in town. So if students come to me and they want to play Madden or 2K, you know, I tell them we don't offer that. But Joe does across the right. river and you mm -hmm. should connect with him. Right. right. And Ali's trying to start the, the high school initiative. But, but what I've noticed is with a lot of the high school events that are going on that are sponsored, there isn't any equity put into it because it's limited to those high schools that are able to compete, right? Not to everyone who may be a high school student who wants to compete, right? So um, for instance, uh, I, I wanted to, we, we ran a pretty big tournament um, called Honey Pot. It was around 260 uh, smash entrance uh, back in April. And Ali straight up told me, I, I can't bring my team to that because it's a community event. And I don't think that that's going to be beneficial to the high school students because they need to compete with other high school students. Right. And, and I get this sort of dialogue that's going on. I understand. So, so my question to sort of summarize it up is uh, the lack of equity is a problem putting it into these community events. So what equity is Generation Esports bringing to not just the high school space underneath Generation Esports, but to the high school community as a whole that is trying to get involved in these areas? Okay, so repeat that again. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm trying to follow you here. So yes. yes. So, so my question is, what is the value proposition to the high school community, not just those teams that are checked off, signed off. Yeah, you can compete, you can play as an official school. To the high school students that um, maybe are part of the Boys and Girls Club, right? That, that have mentors that want to compete maybe with their mentor in a tournament. So um, are you saying that some schools won't allow their students to play in an, another tournament because they have to play for their high school? Correct. This is where I struggle sometimes as an administrator with working with state associations a little bit, I'll be honest, just because when you do start to do that and you and you have your state associations, one, I don't think any company should be tied to a school association. I, we don't have football championships that are sponsored by Adidas. OK, so it's tricky. This is new territory. So it's very tricky when you start talking about athletic associations and schools, because then you're not allowing kids to be in other tournaments. So essentially you're having a company host a tournament. Right. And and I disagree with that. And so I think that we have to be very careful, um, you know, our, our company, any company out there, we have to be very careful about what partnerships that we are going to make so that kids can compete. You know, there are state level competitions. I work with a lot of schools um, that are, um, they want to use their own, their own organization for their state competition. That's great. Use it, you know? Um, and then what if, but if, what if a kid wants to compete nationally? great, then you've got a high school esports league. But I think we have to be very careful and we have to remain open and keep having that dialogue um, with athletic associations because it is hurting some kids to compete at higher levels. There's all kinds of kids. There's clubs, there's, you know, and then there's high level competition. And so we've got to be open to all of that and we can't pigeonhole into one thing. So conversations have to be, I think, very careful with any state, you know, associations because once you say, okay, you can only use this company for our state championship. I, I, I just don't know that I agree with that. Yeah, no, and I, I'm not saying Is that, that kind of, I mean, what you're, but it's like, but, but they can't, because I know like if, if you're a track player, if you're a track runner, you can't go compete in another track, like competitive volleyball, things like that. You can only, you can't play during that season, you know, and I, I think that gets into some really, you know, interesting waters, rough waters. Yeah, it was more the equity that's being put into those without including exclusivity, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yep. No exclusivity. Mm -hmm. So what are your organizations doing to promote equity in the space? So for those schools that aren't able to. I think specifically, let's let's talk more generally. When you through the lens of equity, how are your organizations helping to grow the space through the lens of equity? That's a great question. Thanks, Jim, for asking it. Um, you know, again, our, our approach is a little bit different. We, we address equity and DEI as a whole concept um, by how we, one, 
hopefully reflected in our value structure in what we do in our relationships. But more than that, in, in answering a question you had a little bit earlier, is our competitions are kind of unicorny in a weird way. I mean, we'll do traditional titles, but we have a whole slew of competitions of what we call beyond the game challenges, which are competitions on logo design, web development, coding, event management, um, coaching, uh, data analytics, um, all of those types of things. And those are more than just your title players who tend to be a certain gender in a certain color. Mm -hmm. um, these are people who are all walks of life, um, have all types of color and gender preferences and, and uh, disabilities, et cetera, that may not be the player, but just like the game. So they go ahead and we elevate up all of these various different competitions to the same level as the person who's playing Overwatch or League or any of the other types of activities. And what you find is when you broaden the opportunities, it'll attract different people to do different types of things of what may happen. The person who's gonna compete for logo design or web development is not necessarily the same person who's gonna compete for Call of Duty. And you've got to have this big broad tent and be an attractor for people so that they can find value, affinity. Um, as was said earlier, a lot of the people who are involved in this are so-called first timers. They're not the football player, the basketball player, the joiner of other clubs. So how do you provide these broad opportunities that in and of itself, when done thoughtfully and strategically, address the kinds of con the concepts of inclusion and equity? I have a very simple answer for that. How does Jenny promote equity? Public education is the great equalizer. When you put it and you start normalizing in schools and you create a scholastic pipeline of esports in schools, you're going to have much more equity within the esports arena. Uh, with lack of time here, I'm just going to also have a very simple answer funding for these organizations, having more access to this expensive equipment, being able to find ways to produce that whether that's through a single channel in a state association or whether that's being able to have multiple different organizations. But then you have problems of being able to grow and make sure that these students are eligible, that they're keeping to their grades. Many things that from the stick and ball side have been solved. Uh, and I'll counter to the point that Adidas hosting or sponsoring a football, they do. And this is how football programs are funded in most states now. So bringing that and opening up more access by being able to bring in partners who want to traditionally advertise, this is not selling data to be clear, the access will open up more opportunities, but it takes funding, particularly for a very expensive product where we have a lot of people not paid or, or underpaid significantly. And I wanna clarify that, I totally agree with that. Adidas does sponsor. I just, we don't have any championships that are sponsored, like the state football championship is not sponsored, at least in Kansas by particular, but they do bring in money by having sponsorships. So, yeah. Thank you. I think it's lunchtime, so I'm checked out, but thank you everybody for uh, attending. Thank you guys. Thank that you. that was nice fun. It was, it was good to hear about your stuff too. Thank you. And what was it? It's play. It's what? It's play, play, play esports. Yep. I got to dig into that a little bit. Because what, like, what You're is formally it? CSO? What is that? So well, Star, not... we bought Collegiate Star League. We, okay. did, we did the NACE Star League deal so we combined okay. NACE and Collegiate Star League. Play, play. And then we grew into. So are you guys like, a, I mean, help me understand, like, what you, we, you guys are more of a we, um... multimedia rights organization. Okay. Where it's college and the high school perspective. Perfect. States where we have the high school state association, we're already selling in the football championships, volleyball championships. I'm building esports out of that instead of bringing in infrastructure state by state. So I can do it at a lower cost, driving that, and also using one yeah. of our businesses, like Home Team Sports. We do 70% of the advertising for MLB, NHL, yeah. NBA yeah. locally. Bring that money to have a more cohesive That's product what for the 14. Yes, yes. Did but I have to run no plane. Oh, yeah, go. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I'm sure we'll talk because I know we're, we're talking yeah, Mason and yeah. JV all the time. That makes sense about like championships. That's what I was getting at. Like, I don't want to have. In Kansas, no, but in those states we operate, the state championship is sponsored by somebody. Is that, it that we really? Sell. Yeah. It's big money. See, Kansas, they don't do that. Uh, they, they will eventually, I guarantee. Do you think? <laughs> Oh. 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 what do you mean? Oh. 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 Oh.
of the thing that Connor's building right now. Oh, see, and I don't know much about that. Yeah, it's okay. 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 Probably assume that you did. I do not know about that. Yes, the question is because we got to make sure we want to so I think Thank you. 